are now listening to the Serious Growth Podcast with your host, Leo Costa Jr. Rick, how you doing? Great. How are you? Is this Leo? Yes, it is, sir. Hi, Leo. I'll how be in the you? picture as soon as I sit down, I think. No worries. No worries. Just trying to get my phone all situated here to where it's... Yeah, there we go. Oh, there you go. It's hard to sit down when you're 65. It's a long way down to the chair. Well, we're tied. <laughs> yeah, are you 65 as well? Yes. <laughs> Interesting age, you know. So I got this left knee that doesn't quite quit, you know. And that's just your left knee? Just my left knee. So far, just my left knee. Yeah. You know, it's crazy because I think we've all, I remember my uncle, you know, he was like 30 something. Yeah. And I thought, oh my God, you're ancient. You know, I was, I think I was maybe in high school, eighth grade or something like that, you know, and here mm-hmm. I am 65. I'm thinking, eh, it's, it doesn't, you know, except for the aches and pains yeah. every now and then, but being an athlete, I had aches and pains anyway. Well, you got to get through it, huh? You know, sometimes I, you know, feel my age and sometimes I feel older, but it's all good, you know? Yeah, it is right good. There. Yeah, I'll be right here. Is that, is that good? My head's cut off a little bit. It's a little bit better. Does this sound okay? Yeah. So, Rick, where are you from? I'm uh, born and bred in uh, Long Beach, California. Is that right? Yep. Native Californian. Been here, went through the school system, you know, and uh, all the way through Cal State Long Beach. And, nice. You know, landed in Lakewood here, so I'm living in Lakewood now. And, okay. Uh, Did yeah. they got you, uh, is it kind of opening up back a little bit down there? I mean, I was just down in Venice, but. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, you know, people are starting to come out more. I, I've, uh, you know, I do a little bit of music on the side, and I noticed that we played an outdoor an event. And it was still a little kind of, uh, people are still kind of testing the water still. Yeah, I'll tell you what, this thing's got people spooked. There's no question about that. You There's know? no question about that. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, welcome to the Serious Growth Podcast. Uh, on this show, our mission, hopefully, is to just tell it like it is. And even if it's kind of popular, you know, just whatever goes, goes, man. That's the way I like it. Uh, you know, I noticed on your bio, you have an interesting background and I notice here the first thing that's listed is that you're uh, a musician and you're trained classically. I think I know what that means, but why don't you tell our viewers exactly what that means and in, in the instruments that you're, or instrument that you're classically trained in? Yeah, uh, classical music is more of the art form that came out of Western Europe during the period of, uh, you know, maybe the 1600s and 1700s as it, as it grew out. We all know the popular tunes like, Beethoven's Ninth, bah, 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 yeah. bah, 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 you know, and then we also know the lullaby by Brahms. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm part of the orchestra, so being classically trained to mean that you can get into an orchestra and actually perform uh, with uh, symphonies. Oh, okay. And so classical means that you kind of understand the whole literature that's around those timings, you know, with respect yeah. to Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, and uh, the like. So uh, mostly that, yeah. So I studied that for a number of years. Now, when did you get into music like that? Like, like especially Gosh, the, the, Yeah, when I was a child. You know, I think uh, it was kind of, um, I had this unique ability to listen, to hear, you know, mm-hmm. and maybe some people will debate that, that that's just life, right? Right. Uh, but uh, I was able to listen and hear the difference in pitches. And one was high, one was low, one was the same. And the teacher said, hey, well, why don't you get into a music class? And I think in some sense, well, when I did that, it was as though I had this kind of assignment in life, you know, in mm-hmm. other words, I knew I was going to be a musician where most kids would go into school and music be an elective. I lost an elective because it was a necessary thing for me to take music. None of my family were musicians. Really? None of them were ever interested in any of it. Yeah, I had no family support on any of this. It was just something that grew inside me. I wonder if there's anything in your background, you know, in your, in your DNA somewhere in your family where you know, somebody was maybe a, like a, uh, classical music like a Pavarotti who knows yeah well you know <laughs> my family's from Germany my dad's German my mom's Lithuanian so we could you maybe know, maybe I mean you know Wagner uh, wasn't he from Germany Wagner Wagner yeah absolutely Wagner, yeah. yeah I like <laughs> yeah I like listening to um to classical music I don't know uh, you know I found I'm in bodybuilding and training sure. and typically in a gym it's hard rock it's that heavy metal you know but one of the things I found out that I found interesting was that 
listening to a lot to classical music is much more efficient when you're training with weights um, as compared to the hard rock. And simply put, it was because of the way that hard rock actually beats counter uh, against the way your heart beats, whereas classical is more in line with the way your heart beats. Have you ever heard of this? Oh, I teach it. Actually, you're right on spot on the whole thing, right? I mean, when we look at music in general, we look at it three different ways, right? We look at it first by rhythm, melody, and harmony. And a lot of the classical form actually emulates the heartbeat. Like if you listen to Brahms' uh, second symphony or third symphony, Brahms is in the background going, boom, 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 boom. Oh, yeah. I never, I, I never paid attention to that. Yeah. And, and the other thing, too, about that is that, you know, music uh, has all kinds of expression based on how we're able to kind of, um, you know, live life in a sense, right? So very fast music will keep you going really fast and slow music will keep you, keep you going really slow. But when we get into the classical art form, we learn first how to slow down first, beat the instrument or, or make the rhythm and the beats slow enough so you're playing it perfectly mm -hmm. and then gradually increase. And I think in some sense, this is what we do in karate too and, 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 and at bodybuilding, get your basics down first Make sure you know where you're going and then, you know, apply it to the art form and get better at it. That's interesting. And, and, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, be. yeah, a good analogy because one of the things I talk about all the time in bodybuilding and as a trainer, I always mm -hmm. say accuracy, accuracy is speed. In yeah. other words, I think that's what, exactly what you're saying. Don't get in, in too big of a hurry, at least, especially initially, do it yeah. right. You know, every single time. Right. And then no, go I from there. You know, great, but I think great, that's kind of like with athletes, it's kind of like you're only as good as your, form and technique in the beginning. And then you, you can go from there mm -hmm. without yeah, that. You've, you really shortened that, that uh, potential, I think, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I think it, you know, it's a kind of um, the way we train in Shotokan Karate, which is another aspect of it is that, you know, you're not even a beginner until you get your black belt. You're then you're a beginner. Is that and right? Then you start to learn. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so this is how, you know, we have, and in classical music, the, the, the foundational components are so important, just like your form and function when you're doing weights, you know, you want to make yeah. sure that you're, you're not kind of doing something that's a little bit out of form because then you're just going to train wrongly. Yeah. And you know how difficult that is to undo. I think it's almost, you know, four times the effort to untrain yourself based on something that's done versus doing it right the first time slowly. Yeah. Uh, this is the problem I have with students in music. Everybody wants to play that fast rock and roll really fast, right? Yeah. But they got to slow down and learn how to get up to that fast rock and yeah. roll first, right? Yeah. And so that's part of it. And then I assume just like with training, repetition is the mother of skill. You Absolutely. Know? And then, of course, mm -hmm. if you got the wrong skill to begin with, the wrong form, you just it, it just goes nowhere in the end. You, you just really short-lived, you know. Well, um, it restrict you, you know. I mean, yeah. it's a restriction if you don't. Yeah. All right. Let's take a quick break so I can tell you about our product. Do you want a bone-crushing grip? Good, because you're going to get one with the amazing new TRS Gripper. It's a progressive grip builder with longer handles and a special ergonomic design that's like a dozen hand grippers in one. Start off easy and work your way up to quickly build your grip strength from wet noodle to pulverizing. The package includes a video from the world-famous strength coach, Dr. Russ Horine, the man who worked with Leo Costa to help bring you Big Beyond Belief in the Bulgarian Power Burst. Dr. Horine shows you a simple and easy to follow workout plan that takes just minutes a day right from in front of your TV set if you want. So click on the link below and let's get started building you a stronger, firmer, bone crushing grip. So uh, when you say young, when you got into music, how young are you talking about? Oh, I was, uh, I was um, eight years old. <laughs> eight years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the first interest or instrument, or did you sing? Or what, what actually, which instrument did you get into at eight well, years old and it, why? It, it, yeah, yeah, that's a great, great question. Because uh, I, my first instrument was actually a, a trumpet, you know. And uh, then I just learned that I had to blow into this instrument. And I kind of didn't want to lose my breath in a sense. So, I, <laughs> you know, I thought, well, I don't want to do that. The other thing, too, is that uh, I thought, well, if, you know, if I'm going to go play music, I might want to eat once in a while. And if I'm blowing out of the instrument with food in my mouth, right, like, right. Be the best thing, right? Yeah, interesting. So, yeah. I mean, it was just for me as a child, I was thinking, ah, you know, I'm okay. I was able, you know, I picked up the trumpet, bop, 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 was able to play okay. Uh, then I went over to cello. 
and started playing a little bit of cello in, in school. And I thought, well, now stringed instruments are okay. I like this string stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, and then and then I found out that you can't have cello in the jazz band. Oh. So I said, oh, well, man, I got to get to an instrument that is uh, going to get me into the jazz band because that's where all the cool music is, right? Yeah. I really love the music at the time. And so uh, they uh, said, well, why don't you play string bass? And from there, it just took off. I mean, I, I got on the string bass, and I love the form. Uh, you know, it's a big instrument. It's the largest instrument in the symphony. And from uh, nine years old, I think my first semester there, I was selected to an all-district orchestra in the junior high school, uh, Long Beach Junior High School uh, District, and then went on to continue to play and, and you know, perf uh, get a performance uh, scholarship at the local universities in Long Beach State here in Long Beach wow. City. You found, you found your niche pretty early, didn't you? I did, you know, but I, you know, I got to say that um, I did find my niche really early, but I think by cultivating younger people in a creative form first before teaching them a logical form helps them think outside of the box a little yeah. better. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's like we get into these mathematical models sometimes and, you know, I have a degree in engineering and, and we get blinded by that. We don't think out of the box in certain ways. Yeah. And I think that's been by learning classical music and playing it and, and, you know, studying it over and over again. I'm telling you, you know, you, you, you spot on with respect to this repetition thing, right? Yeah. How many times have I played the Beethoven nine? How many times right. have I done the marriage of Figaro? Right. I can step in it today and, but a little, but a little, 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 yeah. little <laughs> and just do it. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. and this is after all these years. Yeah. You know, uh, again, uh, I like to draw correlations between different, um, you know, music compared to like athletics and sure. like what well, you're talking about reminds me of with uh, coaches uh, today versus uh, coaches years ago. When I was coming through as an athlete compared to when my kids came through, mm -hmm. we played all kinds of sports. We played three sports or just all of them. And yet as, as my kid came in and started playing in high school like me, the coaches were trying to make them more one sport athletes. And it actually works against them. To yeah. just be one sport. And I think that's what you're saying by just with your young ones, let them experiment with uh, different, uh, different uh, instruments or whatever to, because it, it, it develops different characteristics, right? Just like in athletics. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it broadens your, your just ability to uh, critically think in some yeah. sense. No, because I like that. Look at something, you know, in, in one way and then say, wow, you know, like I didn't like blowing into an instrument. That doesn't mean there aren't beautiful trumpet players out right. there. Right. Know? Right. Great sax players, great flute players. That's great. Let them have that. But I think you find yourself more, you know, you kind of, you get that introspective, you're able to kind of see what you want and yeah. then you land somewhere where you're happy, you know? I yeah, mean, exactly. I, I'm string bass playing in the jazz band. And I was pleased as punch about that, you know, in junior high school, it was fun thing. You know? I don't think it gets better than that, to be honest with you. When you love what you're doing, what the hell? I mean, it doesn't uh, get better than that. I don't think so. Uh, I, I actually, my, my family was, um, had a musical background. No, my my cousin read music. <clears throat> Otherwise, everybody else played by ear. Oh wow! They play guitars and that kind of thing. And I learned uh, guitar by ear first, and I learned how to read the uh, the music. But I I got into band when I was in the middle school. Wow! And I ended up playing <clears throat> uh, tenor sax. So I played in a band. I marched with the band, and I would have never thought that I would do that because I'm an athlete at heart, you know, yeah, so right, to play, right. uh, I didn't know I was, I was a creative that way. I didn't know I would like it, but mm -hmm. let me ask you this because I really don't know when you're playing a trumpet, let's say versus a trumpet and let's say a saxophone and a string instrument instrument. Now is a trumpet and a sax, as far as the keys are concerned, are they similar or is it really, are they completely different in the way you have to learn how to read that music as far as how to play it? Yeah, that's a great, great question. You know, the differences in these instruments are really your hand-to-eye coordination. That's really what it's about. You know, wow. it's the same thing when you're working out, right? Yeah. You see a, a set of weights. You, you got to talk yourself into this, right? Because it's a physical act to actually sit there and play these things. So some people, when they get to a saxophone, they feel that this hand coordination is great. They may not be able to do this on the piano in this manner, which would be really difficult. And yeah. it is. And so you learn, first of all, you know, your hand to eye and how you move your hands. And then you say, well, you know, am I comfortable here? Then maybe you try it here with the trumpet. Okay. And then you see if that comfortable, right? And yeah. then if that's not comfortable, then you say, hey, let's go over here and check out this, you know, the instruments. Or yeah. Or I do it this way. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's really important that we allow children to kind of experiment across the board with respect to those types of things. And even adults in some sense. 
Yeah. I think it's a new beginning, a new learning. I think part of life is that every day is a learning experience and that we all should kind of look at it that way into what is comfortable relative to our dexterity and our ability to take it and translate it from our eyes into an actual sound or into a physical workout. I mean, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, and I think it's really important to have somebody like yourself who understands this uh, to be able to communicate and actually implement that into uh, children because I don't think, you know, it's like trainers and coaches that are out there. You have a lot of coaches and trainers that are out there, but there are only a few really good ones that really understand it to the degree I think that you do. Yeah, uh, you know, Thank you. And, and, and uh, so I think that is really important because otherwise if you, you don't have that, you just – you really don't know what you're missing out on. I don't think. Absolutely. I think you don't, you lack it. Yeah. Sometimes you, it, it's kind of rushing through it and not getting the actual understanding. Right? Yeah. So let me ask you this. Uh, how long do you think it took you? Cause it sounds to me like you're a, a master probably at what you do. If you're classically trained and all the reps, I'm assuming that you've had, how mm -hmm. long did it take you to hit what you would consider master status or have you even hit that yet? Uh, I, I think never, <laughs> you know, okay. when you're constantly trying to do this, yeah. you never, like somebody came up to me one day and said, man, you're a great bass player. I never thought I was a great bass player. I always thought that I continue to have to work on yeah. these things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so somebody asked uh, Vladimir Hor Horowitz, I believe it was the pianist, what he was doing. And I might've butchered his name there. He was 93 years old and somebody asked him the same question. He says, well, they asked him in a similar way. They said, why do you practice today and why? You've been 90, you're 93 years. You're the best pianist. You've won the, uh, all the awards and accolades. And he says, oh, because I think I can get a little better. You know, 93 yeah. years old. And I think yeah. this is the type of mentality that drives us to the point of actually wanting to be better and more perfect. And once we say we're perfect, maybe we don't really know that we're perfect. You know. Well, and I, th I think at that point for me, my, you know, my... Um, analysis of that is when you come to that point maybe it's time to get out yeah you stop you stop learning i mean because i feel the same way as you do i've been in bodybuilding now for 38 years mm. and i'm still learning and i want to keep learning more you know i don't want to stop learning because that's part of the juice that that drives wow. me it's like oh man i just you know another thing that i learned and it could be simply just about the physiology maybe not even training necessarily although constantly learning about how fantastic the mind and muscle connection is. And, mm. and I'm sure that uh, with music, you have a mind and muscle connection, right? I mean, when uh, ab obviously. absolutely. Oh my goodness. You know, that, that whole thing is that these are unnatural acts to hold right. an instrument up like this or do this or yeah, this is an unnatural act. You have to train your mind, your, your muscles to, to react to these things. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of like it when you're when speech, right? When, as the older we get, we can't retrain our muscles to, you know, be fluent or be like we in French or something of that nature. You know, uh, we have to train our muscles in music like you do for working out in the same way. Yeah. That, you know, often guitar people, I've trained guitar people, right? And they go, wow, this hurts here. How yeah. come? Yeah. I go, well, you know, you're just going to have to. And my fingers hurt. Why do my yeah. fingers hurt? Yeah. Sore. And, and it's, it's that pain part. And I, you know, hate to emphasize this a little bit. But, you know, we go through pain when we when we try and work out and we try and build a, a, a skill or a talent, right? And these yeah. types of things. And, and I think that's key, too. And so, you know, I don't any different than weightlifting, right? It's so similar, you know, yeah. and I say, I say this all the time, especially as I've gotten older, things are, are the same, but different, you know, yeah. they're so, they're, they just, so they're very close to each other. We don't even know that. I mean, and just like in this case here, you know, uh, the, uh, one of the things I learned about the uh, years ago in 80, late eighties, I went to Bulgaria and I studied with the, uh, the Olympic teams over there, Russia wow. and, and, uh, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, and those people. And the Bulgarians are really amazing. You talk about thinking outside the box. And one of the things that they mentioned, they said, you know, we, we are very different in the way we approach um, our training because we do application first, theory second. And in our country, in the U.S., mm -hmm. it's just the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I asked them, so why? Why do you do that? So they said, because we don't want to be hamstrung by theory. And even though theory might be right, and what they said, and by doing this by through application, you know, in other words, state the goal. In their case, it was to develop the strongest man in the world, Olympic lifting. So what is it that we have to do to do that? You know, you go to the weight room, go to the classroom where your instruments are, and, okay, the, the goal is to do this. Okay, so how do we do that with the tools that we have inside the gym? This is how they thought. And they yeah. said, because what that did is that forced us to think outside the box, 
that mm -hmm. forced us to be creative. Mm -hmm. And then when we saw a result, we knew that it worked. And then we called theory in. We said, okay, yeah. so we know that it works. And now you tell us why. Yeah. Because it, it, in some cases, it shouldn't have worked because it was <laughs> counterintuitive what they were doing. I don't know. Is it like that in music as well? Well, yeah. Let me let me tell you a little story about uh, that because I do have a very very similar thing. I uh, wrote a song that I composed a, a whole uh, orchestration for an eighty piece orchestra, right? right? And so I looked at this piece of paper and theoretically it was perfect. I mean, all the right notes in the right place, all the rhythms and harmonies were great. Stuck it in front of a full orchestra and about halfway through the French horn section sounded terrible. And I go, oh my goodness, you know, what's that all about, right? So I stopped the, the rehearsal and broke down the parts and I went, oh my goodness, this is doing some wrong things here. In theory, it was perfect, right? Yeah. But when we put the sound to it, yeah. It was awful, you know, yeah. so I had to rewrite that the night before, come into the following rehearsal, have them redo it, and then, you know, had to sit there and really play it out. But in my mind, it was something that I thought would have been theoretically perfect, right? Interesting. The, the right notes, the right harmony, the right rhythms, but it was not. We had to listen to it. So you got to get to that practical thing. And that's why I also want to make mention to people that learn based on ear alone. That's kind of the similar thing in a sense. They can go back to the music theory to say, oh, where do I go to this chord after I'm in this key? You know, yeah. oh, maybe I ought to look at the theory of it. Oh, what's this and what's that? Yeah. And it'll help them get to the resolution of some kind of sound that they want to get to, you know, yeah. kind of the same thing. In a yeah, sense. there you go again. And, you yeah. know, the thing about that is um, I think that what happens, in my opinion, when you do theory first, I think it takes some of the magic and the genius out of your creation because you know in baseball now i'm gonna switch over to baseball i had my my oldest son played professional baseball major league baseball okay uh -huh. so i i got there for a while i had the um luxury and um honor of being around a lot of the scouts and i had an old time scout talk to me one time they were looking at my kid doing a workout and i was sitting in the dugout with this guy this scout and he said you know one of the big problems that that a lot of these coaches have especially as the kids are getting up to a high school and college level, he said they make them all robots in the way that they uh, hold their bat in the, in the box and the way they, they, they're so robotic that they take the, the genius and the natural ability that that athlete has to get the job done. Mm. And it's not, it, it, technically it doesn't look right, but it's, it's more in harmony with that particular athlete. There's a, it's a balance there, but do you yeah. find that that's kind of similar also with music as well? Because it seems like it would be. Oh, absolutely. It, it truly is. You know, I mean, it, I was just thinking, you know, uh, while you were talking like that, uh, when going through these exercises of doing things, my teacher would say, play every note right, and then now just play. Yeah. You know, just play the music, you know. Yeah. And, and, a, and a lot of times he would say, look, if you want to stand on your head and punch that uh, note with a, your nose, great if you can do it faster and better than everybody but right. don't forget your your foundations you know right. i mean so it's kind of like at the end of the day if, if it doesn't sound good it's not it you know right. and if and, and no matter what you try and do you know analytics you know, you know do my, my hand should it be like this should it right. be like that should i be here should i be there you know get to the get to the note make it sound right yeah. i had a friend of mine who was a string bassist back when i was playing a bunch of symphony work and and man, this guy had the worst form that anybody can see. But boy, when he got on stage and done a solo, man, that guy was hot. You know? So yeah, what are you, you going to do, right? Stop. Right. Don't do that. Yeah. Curve your fingers properly. Yeah. No. yeah, you'll totally ruin that person. You'll totally ruin it. It's just the same yeah. with baseball. You'd ruin a guy's swing, you know, yeah. if you're doing that. But you have to know, But as an instructor, as a coach, you have to understand and know when not to correct somebody. Absolutely. You know? And you have to be able to, like you say, you're making sure that you're teaching that person that they're well-rounded because you know if you're not well-rounded those those um um some of those weaknesses let's call them weaknesses that you might have like as a hitter they will be exposed the higher you go up and mm -hmm. i would imagine that when you're playing in symphony and you're playing all of a sudden around people that mm -hmm. are highly capable mm -hmm. uh it doesn't take much for you to stand out in both probably good and a bad way right yeah no i i think what you're touching on here is a little bit as the mentality now right you know, once we get all these things done, it's like, can we convince ourselves to abandon some of our fundamentals just to get to the good sound and get to the good, good, uh, good workout in a sense too, yeah. right? 
Yeah. And so you got to look at it in this kind of thing where once we finally get our foundations right, then how do we think that we can move into that other phase of to mastering things? You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you just continue to try and master things and, and you got to get your head right around that. Right. And so when you're, when you're, uh, you're hung up on a technicality, maybe you're not free enough to do the work and to make the sound right. In music, yeah. Right. So yeah. Thinking baseball, I think. And I love baseball too. I'm a big, baseball fan. So. Yeah. Do you, did you ever have a time? Did you ever do like any, uh, when you were doing your symphonies, were you ever somebody who did a solo? Uh, yeah. A couple of times. Yeah. Quite a few times. So. And did you ever have a time where your head and your thinking got in the way of your performance? Well, all the time, <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's a, <clears throat> it's, it's, you know, that first time of getting out there in front of people and, and some of the things that, uh, we did in training in school is we used to have solo ensemble camp competitions, right? So here I am in junior high school and say, Oh, go to your first solo ensemble camp. Right. So I'd go in there and, you know, we'd first prepare with a pianist and me doing a solo on string bass. And, and so we'd go through the rigor of getting ready for that. And then we'd go into the, to the festivals. Right. And all of a sudden there's, you know, 30 kids with string basses showing up trying to compete for the winner of the solo ensemble contest, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so there's, there's where you, you really had to kind of get into that mode. And then eventually as they brought you through more of that education, of getting you in front of people and actually judging you, it became easier to go in front of a bigger crowd yeah. that of maybe five or 6,000 people that were, uh, that were there and, and playing in front of them because they're going to judge you too. Right. Yeah. I mean, when somebody comes and pays for a ticket to come and see you do something, yeah. they're expecting something out of it. Right. right. They're expecting an entertainment value. That's going to uh, give them the kind of thing that they were looking for when they got there. Right. I got to tell you an old story about an Italian opera singer or an opera singer that came over from America to Italy, right? And she went into this uh, room and she sang in front of these beautiful Italians that were there in this opera. And she got done and they said, uh, they said, uh, uh, encore, encore. And she sang it again. And, and then she came out and they said, encore, encore. And they sang it again. And after about 30 times of singing this, this aria, she came out and said, people, what are you doing? I, I you know, I've, I've done it 30 times. How many more times do you want it? And a voice in the background let out, until you get it right. Oh. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch, right? So, Holy crap. She you probably know, should have asked that at, at, after she did it 15 times. So yeah, like well. <laughs> Man. But that was brutal, isn't it? That's brutal. But that's, <laughs> I, what, I that's, then that's, I, that's the nature of the beast. Because like you said, you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to be singing, you know, uh, like that, a solo, I expect to hear something beautiful. Absolutely. Or absolutely. something that's going to move me in a, in a certain way, you know? Right, right. right. It's a well, tough you deal. That's that fear, right? And you got to get out there and just expect that somebody's not going to like you sometimes. You yeah. Know? When so, you did your, when you did your first solo, did it go by so fast that you don't remember that what you did in your solo? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, that's, that's a, that's a real good point too. It's like when you get into these states, you're in a mystified state, you know, you're in this kind of place where you're, you know, it's mysterious, right? You, yeah. You're just in the back of your head, you're going, okay, you know, blah, 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 you know, let's keep going and uh right now i sing i do singing and i do guitar work with a violinist friend of mine we do duets and all in the you know over time it's gotten to this point where while you're doing it okay don't goof up this part in the back yeah. of your head you're still yeah the bits right and, yeah. okay get this going you know and bang bang you know it kind of comes out there and then when you're done you think oh i screwed it up and then you walk off stage and people go that was fantastic yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. that was great yeah. right so i know it's interesting how that how you think you did and Sometimes yeah. when you look back, it's not quite the same or it's better. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that with me, again, as a bodybuilder, one of the things that we had to do is perform on stage and opposing, uh, doing a posing routine at night. You know, yeah. we had to do a 90 second choreographed routine when I first started. And I got to tell you something, Rick, with the, that first one I did, I mean, I practiced for hours. It was my first time. I was sure. I scared out of my, my wits because, I mean, I couldn't even do any kind of presentation in school. I, I used to drop classes if there was a, oral uh, <laughs> component you know what i mean so to be up in, in a in a in the speedo and to <laughs> judging you it's kind of like what you're talking about yeah and, and i went out there and it happened to me it scared the crap on me right before i went on and i did thousands and thousands i mean hours before this competition that that minute and a half and before i went out on stage i forgot my damn routine <laughs> i don't know how that could have happened <laughs> and i you know i panicked but it was too late I had to yep, walk out late. and you know something I went out there I didn't remember a damn thing of that minute and a half 
And just like what you're saying, people came up to me afterwards and they said they were amazed at how good it was. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't believe that. And that goes to show you now, doesn't it? Because I know in athletics, from all the reps that you did, a lot of times you're just doing things off, off of the subconscious that what you, it's already, it's built into your DNA. It's there. You have yeah. to trust that. Because what happened to me several times after that is I would forget. For some strange reason, right before I go out on stage, I would draw blank. Mm. But it had nothing. It never had anything to do with my performance because I trained for it, I guess. Yeah, well, it all comes to you, doesn't it? I mean, after all that work, you know, you do for those hours. I, I'm the same way, Leo, man. I've gone out there going, I don't know how I'm going to get through this piece of music. You know, I forgot yeah. completely blown away, right? Now, how can that be when you practice so much? I know. Well, that's why we practice so much, isn't it? Yeah. Is because that when we lose, the, if, when we get to the point where we lose the cognitive way, we we depend on our on our training and our subconscious way to bring it out. Yeah. You know, and it comes out. You know, it yeah. just it just it forces its way out sometimes. So, and this is where I kind of think, and you probably have the same feeling. Sometimes, and I heard Frank Zappa say this. He goes, "I'm just a technician. I'm operating this tool, and whatever comes out of me at the time I'm doing it, I'm going to do it." And yeah. you, you enjoy it or you hate it, you know, right. one of the things, this is what we've trained for. Yeah. So, you know, it is like he's, he was almost talking about that, you know, he's just a technician on this thing and that he just knows all the different things to do, the tools on it to work it. And then it just comes to you. It just exactly. it yeah. all of a sudden flows out of you. you know? Yeah. At that point, it's more of a reaction than yeah. thinking about it. And that's like with, with hitters at the plate, you know, the great ones, are very calm. They're almost asleep at the plate. They're so calm and so relaxed because if you're up there with your music or anything that you do, if you're tense, what you, what comes out of that music is going to be much different, right? Oh, same way with an athlete. And so you have, yeah, you have to be up there, even though that ball's coming at you 95 miles an hour and it's moving all over the place, you have to be very calm, almost asleep. And then it's that last, it's that reaction that you snap and you come through. You Isn't know? it amazing? It, it, it really it's is. An and and one of the things that I really enjoyed as I continued to compete, I competed for about 15 years, you know, and I got up on stage quite a bit. Sure. And it got to the point, uh, Rick, that when I went out, stage, I didn't freak out about forgetting my, my I, I trusted now that my, all my training, as you said, and my, and my instinct would pull me through. Yes. But what I liked even better was that, and this is what happens, I'm sure, with you and the athletes, you know, when you first get into an area that's uh, a high level, it, the game is fast. It's really mm -hmm. fast. You don't remember a damn thing. But the yeah. more I did it, then the game, the being on stage just slowed down. It was almost like it was crawling. And, I, and the difference was I was comfortable being right. there. And, right. it, and it played even better because the crowd felt that. Yeah. They enjoyed it better instead of me rushing through and it's like, what the hell was that on stage? Somebody that went through and just blazed through a bunch of poses, you know? It's great stuff, isn't and it? I, I, mean, I, I would imagine that the musically, I can oh. just see how it crosses over, that's all. Oh, it's, it's totally crossover. I mean, you know, how many times uh, have you seen just people embrace the music while you're playing it, and all of a sudden you got this energy going? Like yeah. That. And it's, it's you're playing in and out with sure. it all the time. And, you know, um, uh, I think Queen did a thing called We Will Rock You, and then they would hold the mic out to everybody. Oh, yeah. They would sing it and come back, you know. And, yeah. And you just kind of let it go. I mean, the crowd was taking over the music. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. That's it. That's they would true. take it up, and, you yeah. know, that whole interaction is really true. True interaction, that's for sure. I just saw that again on uh, – Netflix. I just ran it again, and it was oh, they, pretty yeah. interesting. You know, Great quite stuff. a quite Great. an artist for sure. So, what was your? Would you say would be your crowning and defining moment uh, in your classical uh, music career? Yeah, well, you know, touring with the Vienna Boys Choir in uh, Europe for a bit with uh, supporting a youth orchestra. You know, I I got to play inside uh, the Mozarteum uh, when I was uh, there, and uh, that was quite a thing. It was just kind of a a, a pickup uh, children's orchestra that I link uh, attached on to but going in there i was um, at the mozart team in salzburg uh, watching you know mozart was born there all this stuff is here i go out into the back of this theater and i'm going to call this my quintessential thing is that i saw this little shack over in the corner of this uh, in the, in the mozart team and i walked up there's a plaque there and it, it said this is where mozart wrote the magic flute and lived while he wrote it Oh and it was this little tiny room, man. I mean, it's no bigger than my little office out here, you know? And I thought he had a desk, he had a bed, he had a pitcher of water and a basin, 
and that was it, you know, and so you can imagine that. So that was one of the crowning moments is getting out there and being able to perform in that. And then going to uh, Vienna and playing in the Viennese stage where the Berlin plays and uh, being able to play with some of the people in the Mozart team and the, and uh, that, that do play there. I, I met a guy there who had uh, some mandals bass. Those, in string bass world, some mandals, the quintessential, you know, god of spring basing you know he's like he wrote the book way back in the turn of the century so this guy had his bass and i oh can i play it you know and yeah. i played a little bit of that and then playing on stage with all the gold and the people that were there yeah. that uh, the berlin does its uh, new year's eve concerts you know that was probably one of the quintessential things that i enjoyed you know you know it gives a whole it gives a whole new meaning you know, it gives a I, whole new meaning oh it, my it gosh. really does and oh. one of the things that was really striking for me was you know, being uh, coming from the United States and going over to Eastern Europe when I did, it was still mm. at that point, the first time I went, it was communist. Second yeah. time was socialism. But the thing that was so amazing to me was the, those castles and how they rebuilt everything. And that, the, you know, now yeah. those, those places were like libraries. And this at one time it was where kings were. I mean, it was just, it just amazing. put a whole new meaning to that. I think every, when I left and came back, I thought to myself, every person, kid in America should, do one of these tours one time where they can understand it because it gave me, yeah. you know, a whole different um, perspective and, Absolutely. and even, even about the people, they were lovely and it was just something oh. I didn't expect, you know, it was really, really cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, as we're transitioning here from your musical career, you're also heavy in technology. So why don't yeah. you, how did you get into that? I'm again, I, I'm assuming you got into this. Obviously you got into it later because you got music seems to kind of came first for yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So how did this all transition? And why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your technological world that you yeah. are yeah. in or ha have been in? Well, you know how an athlete sits there and goes, thanks, mom. When he hits a home run, he goes, hi, mom. You know, afterwards, yeah. uh, I'm going to blame it on mom. You know, my mother, <laughs> actually, uh, um, I was, uh, I was uh, you know, taking, uh, I was playing music and studying in college. And at the, the nighttime, I would go down to the shipyards and work, right? And so I'd work with my dad in the fire department. I, he, my dad was a, in the ship fitters at Bethlehem Steel back in those days. And, and I worked in the fire department. And I was, you know, trying to get to the point where in the daytime I would really study string bass and really, you know, go for that thing in the daytime, 4.30, go and work at night, right? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, after a little bit of time, I got injured on the job and I asked myself, well, what do I want to do? And so my mom said, how about computers? And, you know, this is way back when, you know, the things we think of computing today are so much different back right. in those days, right? You know, yeah. uh, it was just the whole, ma and I can name off things. So I said, okay, you know, what does it take to be a computer guy? You know, and then I said, oh, mathematics. Wow, I got to go do mathematics. I never had a math class in my life. Never knew anything about math class. So, you know, as I'm recovering from my injuries and thinking about what I want to do, I got a little bit of money from a suit from them and, you know, <clears throat> started thinking about, well, where do I want to go and what do I want to do? So I started three months, uh, two months before uh, wanting to enroll in college in engineering school. Um, I went to the math lab at Long Beach City College and just started from arithmetic and just worked my way up as far as I could to get in my first algebra class huh. and then went through algebra one, algebra two at Long Beach City College and then went all the way through into calculus and, you know, started doing, I really didn't get into the computer parts until I got into Long Beach State when I transferred over there and uh, started taking more engineering courses. When I first got into it, it was electrical engineering with a computer option. Then they broke the school off into computer science and engineering and, uh, you know, really, really struggled for a bit. It wasn't easy. It was very difficult to make that transition because here I was in an artistic mind, mind frame and now I had to go use left right right left right. right brain things here you know yeah and 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 I found myself actually feeling physiologically the change really know? so when I play music man I feel the blood on one side when I play you know uh that when I get into engineering school I feel the blood going to the other side of my brain and it's, it I, I like that that's interesting that you feel that it, it was weird, <laughs> yeah. you know, so, so, but I never lost a track of, of playing music. As a matter of fact, while I was in engineering school, of course, I was really poor. I was buying books and stuff. I was playing music and working in the shipyards at night as much as I could to try and make things meet, you know, yeah. it was difficult. Right. Yeah. And of course I won't even talk about the time and all the different uh, stuff that, uh, I mean, it was cheap back then to go to school, you know, Long Beach city college was $10 a, a semester full load. And oh, right. I think Long Beach city, Long Beach state was 125 for my first full semester when I went in there, you know, yeah. eating myself a little bit. Right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it, that accessibility was really there for me. And, and so uh, as I got into through, 
Long Beach State, you know, I had counselors say, hey, go back into music, man. Forget this engineering stuff. It's a struggle for you. But it wasn't really a struggle for me. I think that music and mathematics are similar in a sense. If we look at calculus and the X, Y, and Z axis and looking for mathematics in a complex way, what's the difference between rhythm, harmony, and melody? It's a three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And so mathematics provides that three-dimensional space. Another thing I did is that I went around the orchestras that I was working in and say, hey, well, you guys got day jobs? Anybody got a day job? And they go, yeah, I'm a day job guy. What are you doing? Oh, I'm an engineer. Oh, I'm a computer programmer. I thought, well, geez, man, this got to fit into it, the, the mindset. Yeah. So I kind of made that realization, you know, and then started applying that into the same thing. Now, the problem is I'm running around at Long Beach State and the conductor of the orchestra that sees me walking around. Why aren't you in my orchestra? What's wrong with you? Yeah. I go, oh, I'm in engineering school. You know, I'm kind of yeah. doing this stuff over here. I'm not doing this over there anymore. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. That's not an excuse, Rick. I need you in my office tomorrow to do a preliminary uh, recital, and then I'll bring you in as, you know, third chair on the base section of Long Beach State's orchestra. You know, wow. well, yeah. okay. Here we go. Same thing at Long Beach City College. The guys looked at me and said, oh, gosh, what are you doing? And they pulled me into the symphony. And so I guess I was an asset for them on that side. But in the meantime, I was just studying my brains out, trying to get this math stuff down. And I did eventually. Yeah. The, I was going to ask the the how music impacted you, like your other side, you know, your engineering uh, career. And m the first thing that comes to my mind is I would have thought that maybe my music, if it was me, I'm putting myself in your in your shoes now, mm -hmm. in your spot where you were. I would almost think that maybe the music would be kind of like the what's so important about when you weight train. It's it's you're only as good as you're going to get if you can recover. From what you do it's yeah. not just training harder and not recovering from that i would think that musically the music part of it in my life would be the recovery maybe that gets yeah. me into that parasympathetic state it's am yeah. i am i off on this or no no you're actually spot on you know there's the music granted me so many great great tools to get through that and that's one of them right to be able to kind of fall back on that and relax uh, sometimes I would be in a really difficult situation logically about trying to figure out a program. One time I was, I, I went down to New Zealand and I was coming, I came back and I was working for uh, uh, Air New Zealand at the time. And I wrote, I was having a problem with one of these kind of procedures that I was writing. And so I said, Oh, you know what? Screw this. I went down and started playing a Bach cantata on my, yeah. you know, starting to do one of the Bach things. Right. Yeah. And about 20 minutes went to it. I go, Oh my God, that's it. Yep. Set the bass down, ran over to the computer. So, brrr, oh, it works. Yeah, yeah. And, Isn't that, you know, that's great when it just unlocks a, a pathway, right? It does. It, 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 you know, and, and I think it's, you know, you, you kind of alluded to it a little bit. Although things are different, they are the same, yeah. you know? And, and so when people talk to me about, well, how can you be so good at music and, and engineering and, you know, uh, do that. It's, it's because I see them as one, you know, there is this, yeah. and the one is in the method, you know, I mean, and I also apply that to Shotokan Karate, you know, is that w once you get the foundations down, you know, then, you know, that whole thing just, it's, it's all the same. Get your fundamentals, yeah. make sure you're not missing anything, you know, only go artistic when you're sure your fundamentals are down, yeah. you know, and then feel it, feel what you got in front of you and then deal with it, you know, yeah. if it's good or bad. Right. I think I think it's a good point. There's some common there's just commonalities, you know, Somehow. among those, even though they're different worlds, but they're again degrees of separation, you know. Let's take a quick pause to tell you about something you are definitely gonna want. Do you want a bone crushing grip? Good, because you're gonna get one with the amazing new TRS Gripper. It's a progressive grip builder with longer handles and a special ergonomic design that's like a dozen hand grippers in one. Start off easy and work your way up to quickly build your grip strength from wet noodle to pulverizing. The package includes a video from the world famous strength coach, Dr. Russ Horine, the man who worked with Leo Costa to help bring you Big Beyond Belief in the Bulgarian Power Burst. Dr. Horine shows you a simple and easy to follow workout plan that takes just minutes a day right from in front of your TV set if you want. So click on the link below and let's get started building you a stronger, firmer, bone crushing grip. As a, uh, you, did you say you were an electrical engineer? I was. No, my, my degree is now in computer science and engineering. So, 
Okay, yeah. so how does that, what does that actually mean? Well, computer science and engineering, how do you apply that? And where? Uh, that's both the uh, understanding of the physical development of chips and the internal architecture and hardware of that, and then the programming language to support those chips. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I picked one of the harder disciplines. I could have gone another route and made it a little simpler on me, uh -huh. but you know, my, my pea brain at the time just, you know, I guess I do always select the harder route and uh, go that way and then really get, get it done. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, when you, when you look at it, uh, in, uh, 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 computer science and, uh, you know, how that developed. And to me, it was, it was, um, you know, I think, uh, I think it was something that, uh, um, uh, trained me a lot to understand more about myself, you know, and what I needed to do to try and get through some of the persevering things that we're, we were getting through, right? And, mm -hmm. and try and really figure out, you know, I need to understand this. It is logically correct. You know, the funny thing is that, uh, you know, when I, when I think about my technology training and versus what I do today, what I was training in college uh, is a little different than uh, what I, I mean, I struggled with linear algebra, for example, right? Mm -hmm. But guess what I do now? I, I program matrices that are just, you know, huge. And, and it's like, oh, I had to take that class twice, but now I'm yeah. doing it all the time in my yeah. work. And so, you know, these types of things, you know, it's, it's where you at there and how you progress to this, you know, is that. And, you know, I think the thing is that, again, the music side of it all comes to play, right? I mean, music helps me kind of get through those types of problems and, and understand those types of things. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so do you work for yourself or do you work, a, are you an independent contractor that goes in and solves problems and writes computer programs for people? Is that how it works? Yeah, uh, you know, computing has multiple things. I'm in information technology, which is more on the business side of IT and, and collecting things. Uh, some people think that's the devil, and it's true. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because, you know, computers are important for us in our business models today, right? Yeah. I'm a consultant that goes in and architects the solutions for problems that are happening at a large scale. And then I have my own company, which I've got about five partners that I deal with that are all high-level technology, highly experienced guys. We go in and we save time by being able to put a, an architecture together, a solution really fast, and then do a roadmap to how to get the capabilities into play as fast as possible to solve business problems. Yeah. And so I have my own company that does that now. And so we yeah. can scale up to, you know, large programs or we can help somebody just develop a website. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Good to know. Yeah. I absolutely. might want to use your service. You never know. About well, come on over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, then how long have you been in and doing now this uh, computer science? Oh, geez. It's been uh, 35 years. In the 35 business. years. Okay. Yeah. So that's, is that something that you're currently doing then? I'm currently doing it now. You know, I'm kind of reevaluating my life all the time. You know, yeah. but uh, it's it's something I do now. And uh, you know, I was the uh, uh, former head of the office of technology over at LA Care, which was the largest single uh, largest public payer uh, for that. My projects right now, what I'm looking to do is trying to help people today in the healthcare system, and uh, also help businesses be able to realize information management to a point where they can actually get a grip on all the information that's coming at them so fast. Yeah. You know, that's the problem today with digitization. We've got digital platforms everywhere. There's never been a time in the world that we've had so much data management to be able to work with information, right? But there's also been never a time in the world where we've had so much information that yeah. comes at us so fast, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just an airplane taking off. There's 10 million operations that have to occur and so many different complexities that we just take for granted, yeah. you know, with respect to things. And so what companies are struggling with today and what we see it is, is how to master the information based on certain business domains. Like if I'm in a contact center and I need to have information about a customer, right? Maybe a member inside a uh, insurance company, a healthcare company, they will look at it in a different way than somebody who's on the clinical side that's looking to look at utilization and case right. management and those right. types of things. So how we bring those together are really important, you know, and one of the other things I really want to do and is uh, I have a, a, an invention, my own invention relative to uh, automating a lot of the insurance functions that occur in, in the business today. Right now, I think that we've kind of exploded uh, different areas of uh, how we look at uh, provider to contracted into a network and then member to benefit administrations and how that's brought into how an encounter occurs and when a claim gets paid. I see that as a, a platform and, you know, uh, that can be automated completely. Yeah. And that people can go through pre-authorizations, do case management in a better fashion. Now you have these companies like Optum and uh, and United Health Group and Blue Cross Blue Shield. They all have people that are doing that, but they're focused more on this kind of overall 
per patient per month cost that they have to accommodate for. Yeah. And they kind of lose that fact that if they automated more, they would be able to, you know, be able to save some of the costs and bring some of those costs down. Uh, so it's a challenge right now. And, you know, that means that people have to go through change. Yeah. And when they go through change, that's not a good thing. I mean, people are really resistant to change. You know, it's, it's, that's just normal stuff. It's hard to change. You know? it's and yet, change. If, I think if you, you, you want to stay relative to a degree, you have to be willing to change. I mean, Absolutely. I've been changing all the way through my, just like you said, I've, I've sat, you know, quite a few months ago, I, I thought to myself, okay, how, how am I going to stay relative in my industry? You know, I've been in bodybuilding. I've, I've been an athlete since eight, like you have been in yeah. music. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the way my career went, I wanted to be a professional athlete, but I got hurt. And so I ended up in bodybuilding, which, you know, it kind of, everything just seemed to work out. And funny yeah. that you said that you picked, something that was really difficult to do. I think it's something that's just, it's just a uh, part of who we are. Yeah. Because the reason why I picked the sport of bodybuilding, because it was so damn hard to do. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly why I picked it. It's a lot of discipline. You know? Man. Yeah. And it's, it's, so I get you when you say that, that makes total sense to me, you know? Oh, absolutely. Uh, but I'm constantly, you know, I asked a while back, okay, so how do I stay in this, in this industry? Because I don't want to be that guy anymore, uh, Rick, that competes. I mean, I did it for 15 years. I loved it. I don't want to be that guy that's on social media that's still using my body, you know? Yeah. And I thought what I can do now to be relative is pass on the information that I've learned and just use the old analogy and the quote from, uh, uh, well, my dad was one of them, but uh, Einstein said, you know, true knowledge and real knowledge is through experience. And my dad said it in a different way it's hard to replace firsthand experience. So, you know, I, now I thought, well, you know, this is really cool because here I am talking to you. I talk to people from all walks of, of life mm -hmm. and I try to show the similarity between like your world and my world and how close we really are. Oh, and yeah. I think that's cool. And what a, what a, a fun thing for me to be at this age. I, I can't, you know, and I'm enjoying the moment probably more now. Maybe you can feel the same way mm -hmm. at this age because I, I realize how special it is to be able to do something that I still love doing. And I think I can make a difference. And you know what? I can't control how people are going to take the information that I give out. But mm -hmm. in this case, and I don't mean this to be like some, uh, you know, really demeaning or anything, but I, I really don't care. Uh, you know, it's just something that you either like it or you don't. And I'm good either way. I'm getting it off my chest before I explode and, yeah, exactly. and I'm giving what I think is, is good information. And hopefully I'm getting information from you that makes that other people will see the value and they will, because you're amazing. You're fascinating to listen to. I can oh, tell you that you. right now. Mm -hmm. um, transitioning into your martial arts now, how, when did martial arts uh, impact or when did it become a part of your life? And I'm assuming my buddy Musella has something to do with that. Well, Tom's a big influence on my life relative to the martial arts today. You know, he's the guy I trust the more, most of it to pass down that information, you know, because he's so far out there. Tom is, you know, a brilliant practitioner in karate, oh, yeah. probably the, you know, one of the best kept secrets in, in all of martial art. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the funny thing to me is I was in college and you know how college is. I was an older guy in college. But I loved athletics too, man. I, you know, I was a big basketball player. I'd, I'd pick up basketball game. I went to Long Beach Poly, man. We had a lot of good athletics. And we used to have pickup games behind. So when I got to college, it, you know, after uh, going to work and coming back and returning for engineering school, I joined in with the intramural teams down there at Long Beach State, right? And so every day, uh, every uh, Wednesday at noon, we uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we'd meet at uh, the gym at noon for two hours of intramural basketball. And so what happened is, of course, the intramural leagues would spot you know come up right you'd have an intramural league of basketball yeah. and mostly fraternities and guys like that you know but let me not kid you man some of these guys were minor league baseball players and they were you know yeah. guys that were really minor they were playing on d leagues basketball teams yeah. and so i'm on a three-on-three -three, uh, basketball competition right now get to this karate thing and and we're going through the tournament man and i got a guy who were, who was a football player on the team and and i was on the point and i had another guy who was really fast and, and really tall and, and so we were just kicking buck butt on this tournament and we finally got to the final game you know of this tournament and we're going back and forth and and uh and uh, and going on and and stuff and so uh we're playing this really tough brazilian team and these guys were members of the brazilian volleyball team or something they were oh. just they were playing basketball to keep in shape right yeah, yeah and so at long beach state and so we're sitting there playing and, and we get to the final buzzer and i 
I, I would usually fake a shot and pass it into this guy and he would catch it and, and put it in the basket. So we're, we're, we're getting ready to win. We were one up. We have to win by two. You know, it was that kind of tournament. Yeah. I flip it down to him, shoot the ball. And I spin over to the side of the key. He flips it back out to me to shoot like a 30 foot or 20 footer. And I go, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> so I catch and I shoot, man. The ball gets about six feet from me. And all of a sudden, bang, somebody comes across my head, you know. Yeah, knocks me out. I wake up and there's a nurse and a doctor looking really? over me. Right, I did not see the shot. I did not see anything. And uh, you know, I'm on a gurney. They're shoving me off to the to the dispensary. You know, and and they're they're you know checking me out. And I had a concussion and stuff. Yeah. Uh, three weeks later, two weeks later, I come back to the class after going through protocol, the concussion kind of protocol they had back in those days. They did have it actually. And the guy goes, the guy's going, oh, man, that was amazing, man. You know, that shot went in. You guys won. And I went, oh gosh. And then I thought. <laughs> You know, if I'm going to get knocked out, I might as well go find a sport that I can stand up in front of somebody and not have them hit me from the side. Yeah. So I did some little research, and I saw this thing called Shotokan Karate, the karate club at Long Beach State in PE84 with this guy named Don Dupree. And I went in there, man, and there was a ton of people in there. And I was yeah. like, wow. And, you know, so we got into the class, and Don was a, a awesome teacher. But he, man, he pushed the daylight, daylights out of people. So that, that like two weeks later, the class was down to a few of us, you know, right. that love the kind the of serious work. ones. Yeah. The, serious. The uh, sick ones weeding, in the mind. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> he was weeding them out, you know, yeah. and then I got, when I got into there, then, then I, I you know, it, the, the, the training turned into the same thing that I can apply with classical music and yeah. technology, the basics. Right. That's right. And then before you get to the art form, you know, and so I studied my punches, I studied my kicks, I studied my block. And, and so and then I went to my first special training, which the special training is a big deal for Shotokan. Uh, first special training will probably improve your karate 70%. And there's this wild, crazy guy named Tom Yuzula leading their special training. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God, he was a god to me. You know, I yeah, mean, yeah. He's this, this, you know, chi, me, son, chi, go. Yeah. You know, we're, we're going all this stuff. And, and one of our members, uh, a good friend of him, was killed during that uh, thing. He was a cop. And so Tom, you know, kind of, I thought, wow, showed a lot of, a lot of emotion during that special training too. And he just, he, him and a lot of the seniors were really, I mean, to, to sit there and watch that uh, was the dedication into the art. It made me yeah. think, Oh my gosh, you know, this is bigger than our lives, yeah. you know, and for a man to take this through all of his life, the way Tom did yeah. and, you know, knowing him, what I know today about him, I was just I'm blown away, you know, yeah. the whole thing. And, and I, and I'm just a small practitioner compared to, you know, the legacy of Tom and what he's done. Oh, so yeah. I, I, Tom has been a real influence and the karate thing actually helped me in a couple of ways too. One to for my perseverance, right? I mean, you're not even in really until you get to the point where when your mind is tired, then that's when the training starts. Yeah. Everything else is just noise up to that. Point. Right. You know this from your yeah. weightlifting, right? Exactly. It's just noise until you get to that point where your mind says, I want to quit. Yeah. And then that's when you go. Yeah. Know, that's when it starts. Yeah, exactly. And then, and you learn a lot about yourself in, in that moment because that's, you have to embrace that, sh that stuff that I catch myself there. You have yeah. to embrace that. <laughs> You know, uh -huh. every day. And yeah. who in the hell wants to do that? Only the serious, you know, a little bit twisted, out of balance, yeah. just a little bit <laughs> are willing to do that, you know? And a lot of people just don't realize that. I mean, even like in bodybuilding, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people over the years have come and wanted me to get their money for a show. And I always tell them, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. And I don't want right. to be a downer, but you probably are not going to end up on stage. It's a very small people that get to where Tom is. And, you know, it sounds like to me that you're down that path, maybe a, you know, further down, but you're, you know, it takes a lot of damn dedication, even on the days that you don't feel like it. And especially when you don't feel like it. Yeah. No, it's kind of like that old story where Lee Iacocca goes into, a, you know, Carol Shelby's office and says, Hey, I want to beat Enzo Ferrari in a race yeah. in Le Mans. Think we can do it in three months. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. A uh, dude, <laughs> you know, you can't buy a win, right? That's, that's I mean, for just, sure. Yeah. Yeah. How often do you, are you still training in, in the yeah. arts? Do yeah, you, I still train. Do you yeah. go like three days a week or something, four days yeah, a week? Yeah, I do. I do actually, you know, I do, I ride my bike about uh, 15 miles a day to keep my cardio going. And yeah. uh, I do that five times a week. And then I go to Tom's class on Thursday night because I get so much out of him. Yeah. And then I train with Tom when I can uh, on the side. And I head to a class when things are there, you know, I mean, it's, it's at a point in my life like you, I mean, I, sometimes I, if I can make it, I can make it, but I still try and train and, you know, I don't worry about anybody else at the dojo. If they don't like me being there or being there, whatever, you know, yeah. I show up. Yeah. Right? 
yeah. and, and, then, and then I just train. So three times a week, uh, I keep my cardio going. I'm trying to get a little more lifting going because I think, you know, we need to keep our bone density even right. still as we get older and things of that nature. But um, yeah, I still, I still like to train, you know, I mean, 65 years old and still, still doing that. Most of my friends can't even lift their knees up. There you go. Buddy. There you go. That's and, important. You know, you and I, we, we, is, I think we're reaping the benefits of all that, uh, you know, hey, you know, here, here's how bad it is for me talking about being twisted. And I don't have, I still have a studio, um, a, a gym, a studio, a personal training yeah, studio. Sure. And mm -hmm. when I was training back in the day, I've been getting up at three o'clock for years, believe it or not. Yeah. And I still go to my studio. I open it. I'm up at three o'clock in the morning. My wife said, what is wrong with you? I said, you'll, you'll never understand. You will not, you will not get this. I have to get up at that hour and I have to be down at the gym at four o'clock. Mm -hmm. I, it's just part of who I am, I am. you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's pretty hard to change this old dog at this stage of the game. But like you said, I'm 65 years old and I can do a lot of stuff, even in my training and the things I do today that a lot of people in my age, I can't. And I'm, yeah. you know, I want to keep it going that way. I like feeling this good still at this age and I, I don't want the wheels to fall off just yet, you know? No, um, absolutely. And I got to tell you just a really quick story about uh, Tom, uh, Tom and I. I've known Tom now for, oh, I guess, I'm going to guess maybe 30 years. Wow. Uh, you know, 25, 30 years, you know, we met and did a, we wrote a program together, Explosive Power. Of course, mm -hmm. Tom has a tremendous amount of insight, as you well know. But I have to tell you, you know, I'm not that guy that is, that talks and hangs out too much with buddies. I just, I've never been that guy, you know. But I have to tell you, Tom and I are like a couple of old women. And, you know, we, we call each other and like, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> you know, that type of thing. Just checking in. And, yeah. it's, you know, and, and you probably Great. can understand this. And we've known each other long enough to where even if we don't talk for a while, sometimes we go stretches of maybe a couple months or so. Yeah. But it's just like the minute that that phone call is there, we always call each other back. Always. Yeah. Always. And we just kind of pick up and we just talk. We talk about important stuff, but we also talk about nothing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that's a sign of a, a good friend. And, yeah, absolutely. And like yeah. I said, I'm not that person. It means a lot to me because, I, you know, some people, they like to hang out with their buddies and they do a lot of stuff with their buddies, and that's just not what I do. So I, I find it really um, kind of interesting and special that I have a buddy like that, you know, yeah. that we, we you know, stay in touch with each other after all these years. I think it's pretty cool. No, Tom is a great guy, and, and I kind of have the same relationship in a sense, you know. It's I don't have to worry about it, and he calls me up. We call each other back, you know. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I help. Honestly, though, uh, Tom calls me a little, a little bit a lot, a, a bit of my, a bit, <laughs> I won't say much, but a bit about his technology needs because, you yeah. know, I'm the kind of, everybody my age don't get it, you know, and I'm the Oh, I know. I'm one so of everybody the calls me and says, hey, can yeah. you fix my phone for me? Yeah, you might want to change your phone number. I might be doing that too. <laughs> well, the thing is, is, <laughs> <laughs> His big systemic design isn't like working on a phone or a computer like yeah. this, he does. Yeah. but it's yeah. fun. It's good. I help him out because I got the logical mind and I get it. Yeah, that's cool. Hey, listen, before we go today, would you like to, um, on, the, on our podcast, would you like to promote anything that you're doing or just have some final thoughts? Uh, sure. Well, um, you know, finally, uh, thank you for having me today. I really appreciate that. And and some of the things that we're doing is if I can get anybody to go to counterpointsolutions.com, that's our consulting website. If you're in need of anything with technology, we can look at it and try and evaluate your need. If you're somebody who has a, a large company and you're really trying to solve problems, we do that. If you're somebody who's just a personal uh, a website or something to get done, we can get that done. And uh, I think that's that. And then on Saturdays, I actually do an online music class. For anybody who wants to learn music, it's free. I do a Zoom class, you know. If you, yeah. if you go out and uh, check out, um, uh, just contact me through counterpointdelivers.com. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll be able to, I'll give you the insight on what to get into that. So if anybody wants to do that too. Nice. Well, listen, man, I, I really do appreciate you coming on because, you know, I get uh, as much out of this, if not more, from the people that I end up talking to because I, I got to peek inside your your mind and, and the stuff that you know, and you just made me, I think, a little bit smarter, even if it's temporarily, because I'm losing my mind just a little bit. But yeah, that's uh, great stuff. It's been really good. It's been a really good interview. I appreciate you coming on. So uh, maybe we can do this again down the road. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thank you. Very okay, much. sir. Okay, well, take thank care, you man. very much for coming on. Appreciate bye -bye. it. Bye. Thank you. See you later, buddy. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the Serious Growth Podcast. For more episodes like the one you just listened to, subscribe to us on your mobile podcast app and
and leave us a review. If you'd like to reach out, you can find us online at SeriousGrove.com. Until next time, train smart and train hard.